All right. So good uh, evening. Thanks to those of you who are listening in. I appreciate you taking the time. Welcome to Polyventure Week 8. We're almost done with the term. How exciting. Uh, recall that this workshop was about uh, using games to relate concepts uh, in the discipline of political science. And we talked about a number of games over the course of the eight weeks. And these last two weeks have been focused on real world applications. So I'd like to go and continue on with that process of applying um, our model that we've developed over the past eight weeks to uh, real world uh, situations. So our learning objectives are the following. First is you'll be able to list the seven concepts that we developed over the workshop and then apply those concepts to real world politics. So again, recall the seven concepts are the following. Communication can be direct or indirect. Information can be complete or incomplete. Strategy can be cooperative or competitive. Moves can be simultaneous or sequential. Network can be simple or complex. Probability can be high or low. And then lastly, signals can be more clear or less clear. Now, what I'd like to do is to play uh, brief clips uh, from two press conferences. One was yesterday. Uh, the uh, Senate uh, Democratic uh, leadership had their press conference. And then today's press conference by the Senate Republican leadership. I'll play about six to seven minutes of each. And then what we'll do is we'll talk about how they relate to each other or what uh, uh, how they map onto these seven concepts. So we're going to get started. Our first one is the Senate Democratic Leadership News Conference that was held yesterday. I'll go ahead and uh, open that up. Family. As New Yorkers, we will. Thank you. New York Democrat and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer addressed sexual harassment allegations against New York Governor Andrew Cuomo and called for him to resign. This was part of a news conference to discuss the Senate's legislative agenda. Senator Schumer said the Senate would continue working until it passes both the infrastructure package and the budget resolution before leaving for the August recess. So I just want to point out here really quick what happened was that this fellow whose back is now turned to us, that's uh, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, and his team was walking up towards the podium to do their press conference. And then at the last moment, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer came in and swooped on the podium. So we'll continue on. Prerogatives of the majority. Okay, can we have some quiet, please? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I am proud to be joined by Senators Durbin, Murray, and Stabenow. Now, when the Democrats won the majority, I said it was the end of the Senate legislative graveyard. The Senate is moving forward on our two-track infrastructure strategy, and it's going along well. We are making good progress. We've already held more votes on amendments than in any of the recent years under Leader McConnell. Already, and we're only in July. Before the start of the bipartisan infrastructure proposal, 56 amendments had received roll call votes this year. Yesterday, we voted on three amendments and adopted two of them, one led by Senators Thune and Tester, another by Senators Padilla and Moran, bipartisan, both were adopted with more than 90 votes. Today, we voted on two more amendments, and we're working up to set additional votes this afternoon. This is how the Senate is supposed to work. I'm proud of the work done by our members throughout the weekend to move this bill forward. The Senate will continue to work through the bipartisan infrastructure bill on the floor, but we must work efficiently to set up those votes 
That requires cooperation, as you know, between the majority and the minority. And as a reminder to everyone, we've already gone through this same process with several bipartisan bills this year, with the anti-Asian hate crimes bill, the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act, and the Water Infrastructure Bill. And since I know all of you want to know about the upcoming schedule, the Senate will complete both the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the budget resolution before we leave for August recess. Timing for the next step will be driven by when we finish the bipartisan infrastructure bill. I just want to reiterate what I've said for weeks. The Senate is going to stay here until we finish our work. I've told my members to keep their schedules flexible, as we may need to work through the weekends to get the job done. I hope we can use our time in the Senate efficiently. The longer it takes to finish this bill, the longer we'll be here. Senator Durbin. So that was Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer from uh, New York uh, giving some comments. And you heard um, him speak to things about a bipartisan bill. This is related to the transportation infrastructure bill uh, that was um, uh, agreed to last week and now is making progress uh, this week with different amendments. Uh, so we'll go ahead and uh, set that aside for a moment and we'll listen to today's press conference by the uh, Senate minority uh, team or the Senate Republicans led by Mitch McConnell. Let's go ahead and minimize this. And we'll listen in on this press, uh, press conference. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We know what's coming next, a $3.5 trillion reckless tax and spending spree. Um, the absolutely worst possible thing we could be doing in our country right now. Um, playing Russian roulette with this economic recovery, which has already been threatened by this raging inflation created by the rescue package earlier this year, these taxes are going to hit the country really hard. There was a Wall Street Journal article <clears throat> a couple of days ago featuring a landlord in my state uh, who had been investing over the years in rental property in order to guarantee his retirement. This would affect, under these uh, capital gains increases that they have in mind, it basically would cut his assets in half in half. This is a devastating proposal, whether it's corporate tax increases, pass-through tax increases, capital gains tax increases, stepped-up basis, an absolutely devastating blow uh, to our economy at the worst possible time. So as you heard, uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell just prefaced it and says, we know what's coming next, right? So the day before, uh, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is saying, we're going to pass this infrastructure package, and then we're going to pass this uh, budget uh, bill, which that budget bill is related to a $3.5 trillion proposal that's being uh, discussed by Senate Democrats. The difference between those two bills is that one is a bipartisan one, which has support of at least uh, 17 uh, maybe 10 to 17 other Republican senators plus the 50 Democrats. The, the budget reconciliation proposal uh, doesn't appear to have any support from uh, the Republican Party. So this is a 50-50 split. And um, this is the minority's position. In this case, obviously, they're framing it as, um, <laughs> you know, this is the worst thing that, quote unquote, could be done at this moment in time. So let's listen in on uh, the uh, John uh, Doon uh, from uh, one of the Dakotas. Leader pointed out, we know what's coming next, and that is the, the Democrats' reckless uh, $3.5 trillion uh, tax and spending spree. Um, and we know it's going to raise taxes on middle-income Americans. Uh, I am particularly uh, concerned and interested in this subject because agriculture is our number one industry in South Dakota, and farmers and ranchers uh, stand to bear the brunt of a lot of these tax increases. 
there was a study down by, done by Texas A&M, and in their 30 state um, region that they, you know, that, that is contained in their database, uh, they said that every farm and ranch operation would be impacted and that the average tax liability, average tax liability for farm or ranch operation in this country would be $700,000 under the Biden proposal. Um, in South Dakota, and like a lot of uh, states that are represented here today, we have uh, generationally owned, family owned uh, small businesses, farms and ranches. You want to see them to be able to pass that on to the next generation. And what this double death tax would do, as the leader alluded to, not only do you have the death tax, which hits these, hits these farm and ranch operations, but now you will have this new increased capital gains tax which does away with, with what's called the step up in basis, which dramatically increases the tax liability for people in this country. And we're not talking about rich people. The, the gentleman that uh, the leader referred to in Kentucky uh, pays himself $75,000 a year. He invested in these apartment buildings 27 years ago, and um, he was hoping at the age of 64 to be able to have a little nest egg for retirement. And his tax advisor has told him that it would reduce his take-home pay or what he would get out of the, uh, the sale of that asset by a half. He'd end up with a half of what he was looking at uh, for his own retirement after investing for 27 years in that, in that business enterprise. That's going to happen repeatedly all across the country if, um, if what the Biden uh, tax plan and the uh, Democrats' reckless tax and spending spree here on Capitol Hill um, is allowed to go forward. We are going to do everything that we can to stop it. We are going to stand with middle-income Americans who are going to who are going to be hit and again uh, bear the burden of paying for all this uh, new uh, massive uh, increases in spending that the Democrats are proposing. And uh, we just think that uh, the American people, uh, when they find out what's going on, uh, no matter their income class, are going to say enough already. And uh, we're going to be there with them. Uh, trying to stop this at every turn, and, um, and we expect that uh, when this is all said and done, the American people, when they render a verdict on this idea, it's going to be a big thumbs down. Uh, next up is uh, Senator Barrasso. Well, you talk to the Democrats, and they are actually eager to jump to this reckless tax and spending spree. It's going to start next week. We've already spent $6 trillion in coronavirus relief. And now they're talking about three and a half to five trillion more of big government spending. It is time for the American people to stand up and speak out and say, we've had enough. It is time to stop because the American people realize every one of them is in one way or another going to pay for this. And so this press conference goes on to talk, um, have different senators from different parts of the uh, country speak about things. But what you'll notice uh, between Leader McConnell's comments and then Senator Thune's comments and now Senator Barrasso's comments is like the messaging, the language that they're using, right? And it's uh, the way when they use that specific language, the idea is that gets picked up by the media and then it gets disseminated out to the broader public who's starting to hear about this or engage with this um, on the topic because it's becoming more salient as politicians speak about it. So what I'd like to do next is um, just go through our uh, table here to show like how this relates to uh, the seven concepts that we've engaged with. So recall for communication, right? It can be direct or indirect. In this case, I would argue that this was, uh, these are both direct communications to the press and to the public um, that um, both are speaking to, and it's indirect to each other because the, Senate um, Chuck Schumer and the Democrats are saying we're going to do one bill and then we're going to do the other bill. And then the um, minority leader the next day is saying, let's just go to this. Let's just talk about the second bill. So I'll get to why that's important in a few moments. Now, when it comes to information. Obviously, I would say this is um, incomplete. Because we're hearing things, and if you're hearing this for the first time, so say like, for example, so if you're listening, it's like, okay, I didn't know this was happening or that was happening. I don't, like, I don't even know who these senators are. And that's totally fine, right? Because they're not our California senators. Um, so there's incomplete information in general if you're listening to this for the first time. But if you're following it day in and day out, which uh, a good number of people do throughout the country, I would say probably a few tens of thousands uh, paying attention very closely to what's being said every single day then this would be um, uh, not as incomplete. But for us, it's incomplete information because we're like, okay, what's this? What's that? What's going on? Uh, when it comes to strategy, 
Um, it can be cooperative or competitive. And what you heard in the Democratic uh, leader's um, statement is that it wants to be cooperative on the bipartisan bill, on the infrastructure bill, but he didn't seem to signal that same language in the uh, other bill. So cooperative on bipartisan and then competitive on the budget uh, resolution bill. So I'll write that here. Now, in hearing uh, Mitch McConnell's and the others' comments, obviously it's if there was no conversation about, oh, we're going to pass this infrastructure bill, things are great. You know, even though we're, <coughs> we're doing that, we wish we could do other things. Um, <coughs> they jumped right to the competitive side of things. Now, when it comes to moves, um, it's, it can either be uh, simultaneous or sequential. And obviously, in this instance, this is a sequential move because the Democrats spoke on, on the third, so yesterday, and then the Republicans are speaking today. So they're going one after the other after the other. Uh, so these are both sequential moves. Uh, when it comes to network, obviously, I, I would say this is a simple network because you only see like five or six or three or five people up on the stage. So it's not too complicated to point out. What's important to note here is that um, both the Senate Democrats and Senate Republicans have leadership teams. And while they have leaders, they also have like vice chairs and chairs and other folks who are like are consistently engaged and like demonstrating their um, leadership role. So it's not a lot of senators um, who are in leadership roles, uh, at least at the chamber level. You have uh, senators who are leaders of committees as chair people, uh, but at the chamber level, you'll have you know a small cadre of folks. So I would say these are both simple networks because you're not seeing like all. 50 uh, Republican centers and all 50 Democratic centers giving these press conferences. It's just the leaders uh, for both of those parties. Now, for probability, this is like something high and low. Neither group seem to uh, speak to a low probability of things happening. So I would say there's talking in high probability. In this case, the Democratic leader saying that we're going to get a bipartisan bill, whether it takes this week, next week, or the whole summer. And he also said that we're going to push for the budget resolution. So both of these. Um, um, piece of legislation are, are moving forward with some high probability. Now on the um, Republican side, and this is what makes that the language interesting, is that they could have spent some of their press conference talking about the bipartisan bill, the infrastructure bill, but they didn't. So what that signals in my mind is that they see that there's a very high probability that that bipartisan bill is going to get passed without too much more argument or debate. Um, the other thing was that because they jumped right to the budget resolution, that also demonstrate that there's a high probability that will pass because they're starting to focus in on it more intently with particular language and other things. So both sides see the probability of both bills um, uh, uh, there. Now, the last one on signals, and I really wanted to talk, uh, focus on this. In U.S. politics, in congressional politics, a lot of it is signaling, right? So we hear these press conferences, which is direct forms of communication to the press and to the public. You know, we have the sense of different strategies that are being employed, but these press conferences over the years in the Congress, whether it's the House Democrats and Republicans or it's the Senate Democrats and Republicans, they're used as signals to communicate to the media, to close watchers of politics, to policy, to uh, the paying attention public and then to the general public about what's going on. And so when I watch these two press conferences, when I hear uh, uh, Democratic leader Schumer talk about what's going on, I'm like, okay, he seems, he sounds confident. He sounds like uh, he has a strategy, which is we're going to stay in Washington until, until things get done. And um, there wasn't like any downbeat to his, 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 um, his speaking. And that gives a sense of, okay, there's confidence in the trajectory that they're taking, right? Which if you're closer to like, okay, that's a good sign if you're supportive of these efforts, or maybe it's not a good sign if you're not supportive of the efforts. Now, on today's uh, Senate Republican press conference, I was surprised by a couple of things. The first one is the Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, he didn't speak for much time. He just like gave a couple of sentences and he was done. What I noticed though, um, I don't know if you picked up on it, but his language um, was pretty... Uh, uh, direct about this, you know, he labeled it a democratic tax and spend bill, some monstrosity, you know, like really harsh language. But one thing I noticed was the the lisp in his voice. And I was paying really attention to his lip because I'm like, it sounds like he had like a like a 
dental work or something like he had like a, a numbness and I was like huh it made me question uh you know uh, you know <laughs> did he go to the dentist the, the, that morning and get some tooth work done or is you know is he okay um, health wise um, and there's been a lot of questions about majority leader McConnell's health over the past uh, a couple uh, years um, given his age and given his um, he had a fall you, you know he had a per- for a while so it looked like there was bruising and i was just like focused in on that um besides what he was saying um additionally when he had uh, senator john thune and um barrasso what you'll notice is that they told the story of this fellow in in kentucky apparently who's owning multiple properties and is really concerned that the that the the, the budget reconciliation bill would uh, adversely affect his rental income or what what have you and what i've noticed um is that those anecdotal stories are pretty consistent with uh, the Republican Party and their leadership when they talk about things. And I've noticed this over the the years now where it's always like, how does this uh, affect a person? And they have this story of somebody. Sometimes they have a name, sometimes they don't. Um, But it always makes me, uh, it always contrasts pretty well with uh, the Democrats who don't, uh, don't do that as much. And so it's like a way of signaling, like, who cares about the people, right? When you talk about someone in a particular case, a particular circumstance that are going to be affected in a particular way by a policy issue that's being discussed or debated in the Congress, it might send a signal to your to the public, okay, they're caring about what's going on. And the reverse can also be true. If you don't talk about that, then people might say, oh, okay, you, got, you, really don't, you really don't get how this is affecting me, right? Um, so I saw both uh, those multiple dynamics involved in the uh, press conferences. Uh, With that, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to uh, listen in and we'll get to our discussion. So take care and have a great night.